Uh, so hello everyone. Uh, thank you for tuning in again to people that are coming in for our second session and hello to people that haven't been to our first one yet. Uh, this is the second MMU Gothic Approaches session uh, on Queer Gothic, uh, postponed due to strike action, but now we're back with new and improved chat function, which we're all very excited about. You can actually interact this time, which is going to be super exciting, obviously. Uh, I'm Oliver Rendell. I'm here to reintroduce the series before palming you off onto Teresa, who's going to be your chair for tonight. Uh, like last time, if I could ask you all to keep your mics and cameras switched off. Um, yeah, that would be great. Uh, please do throw any comments or questions you have into the chat, though, uh, before the fickle tech gods take it away again. It could happen any time, we're sure. Um, we're going to be recording this event. You can, we're already recording this event um, to make it available on the YouTube. Uh, so the first session is already up there. Thank you to Zavi for battling his way through to making that work. Um, and this one will be available as soon as it's, as soon as we can get it up there. Um, yes, so once again, uh, a few thanks. I'd like to thank the Manchester Centre for Gothic Studies and all the staff for enabling this webinar series. Uh, for those that don't know, since 2013, the centre has been offering postgraduate studies for MA and PhD students uh, interested in all things Gothic, spooky, scary, all that stuff. Well, not so Gothic and spooky, I guess, in the 21st century. Um, Anyone that's keen to get involved with the centre, uh, the Modern and Contemporary Gothic Reading Group is starting up again in May. Uh, all are welcome. Uh, and I think they're still looking for organisers. Uh, you'd have to check. Uh, last series was a great success. Uh, everybody got a chance to suggest what books they wanted to get discussed by the panel, uh, by the, the group. And uh, hopefully there'll be more creepy mushrooms. That was a fun conversation. Um, once again, we've got Manchester University Press uh, supporting us again. Uh, there's a 30% discount code available. Uh, Kate, I think you have access to put it in the chat this time, and you should actually be able to get access to the code this time, which is a nice development. Uh, MEP of plenty of titles written by the MMU staff uh, and plenty that will be of interest to Gothicists, so everyone do have a look. Gothic Approaches itself is organised by current PhD, PhD students uh, at MMU. Uh, that's myself, Teresa on the screen now, Kate Maloney, Fred, Frederick Blanc and Alicia Christina Edwards. This series is showcasing the diversity in Gothic research that is uh, now underway at MMU. Each session offers two papers on contemporary theme, on a complementary theme, sorry, that the speakers will address for 20 minutes each. Questions will then be taken at the end, and tonight they'll be picked up by Kate, our friendly neighbourhood moderator. Uh, or if you're comfortable switching on your camera, that's fine, of course. Uh, come on online and ask your question, though we would ask if you could put the questions in the chat so we have access to them afterwards. Uh, thank you. Uh, tonight's session, as I said, is called Queer Gothic and our speakers will be discussing questions of LGBTQ plus representation and erasure in Gothic texts. And so without further ado, I'll hand it over to Teresa and we'll start recording while well, we're already recording. But yeah, good luck, everyone. Thanks, Ollie. Um, so I'm the chair this evening. My name is Teresa Fitzpatrick um, and it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker this evening to you. Um, Hayley Charlesworth is PhD um, student at the MMU um, and she's, her research is on developing representation of bisexuality in gothic media and television and her talk this evening is entitled Bisexuality, Morality and Buffy's Empire Doubles. I'm going to invite Hayley to share her screen with you and you have the floor. Thank you. I'll just get my screen share up. Um, hang on. <laughs> Can I just confirm with you, Teresa, that that's up on the screen? It is. That's great. Okay, um, remember excellent. to our audience, any questions for Hayley, put them in the chat for her. Hayley. Okay. Um, first of all, I just want to do a quick apology. My entire household has just recovered from COVID, so sorry if I do end up having a bit of a 
a coughing fit in the middle of this. OK, so um, in Monsters in the Closet, Harry M. Benshoff points to the 1980s as a significant turning point in the depiction of the monstrous queer, one which sees two distinct forms of representation and a cultural history which will later influence the production concepts of the 1990s, in which both Buffy the Vampire Slayer and its spin-off series Angel began. Benshoff identifies the rise of a new era of political conservatism, the AIDS crisis, the politicization and continued mainstreaming of gay and lesbian culture and the development of queer theory and praxis as contradictory influences over the monster movies of the period. A rise in Christian fundamentalism spearheaded by a view of queers as carriers of disease allowed for some horror movies to return to the tactics of earlier decades using gay and lesbian signifiers to colour their monstrous and minoritised characterisations. However, a counter narrative to this is that the rise of queer theory leads to the overturning of the genre's conventions in order to argue that monster queers are actually closer to desirable human normality than those patriarchal forces such as um, religion, law, medicine that had traditionally sought to demonise them. In short, these texts make monstrous the institutions that made the queer monstrous in the first place. It's these two opposing schools of thought that allows for both the monstrous queer, such as the villainous lesbian in Basic Instinct, and the sympathetic queer monster, such as Jesse in Nightmare on Elm Street 2, Freddy's Revenge, to coexist in the 80s and 90s. These counter narratives may be seen in Buffy and in Angel. The sympathetic monsters, such as the vampire with a soul Angel, criticise the demonisation of the queer. An example would be the pagan religious sects responsible for restoring Angelus' soul, with Angelus being the name given to Angel's um, soulless uh, vampire self, um, using witchcraft to punish his immorality with eternal shame and torment, um, which could be akin to the concept perhaps of praying the gay away. Meanwhile, many of the villains, such as the vampires Spike, Drusilla and Willow's vampire double, the human monsters Faith and Warren, and even the hell god Glory, reinforced by sexual monstrosity through the sexualization of their interactions with the monosexual male and female heroes. While Buffy was indeed a revolutionary programme, often pointed to as progressive for the loving same-sex relationship between the characters of Willow and Tara, for featuring the first lesbian sex scene on US network television, and for its specific feminist rejection of the helpless female victim, is ultimately a product of a cultural context in which homosexuality in the mainstream was still in its emergence, with bisexuality an afterthought or a scapegoat for the negative predatory stereotype once thrust upon homosexuals. It's thus my reading that, whether implicitly or with intention, the series Buffy and Angel both attempt to be innovative and progressive in their approach to homosexuality, but were ultimately conflicted, having the consequence of displacing negative stereotypes onto its villains or erasing the bisexual potential of its heroes. I've chosen these texts specifically to analyse because of their innovations and their limitations as a distinct example of biphobia and bi erasure being an unfortunate byproduct of an attempt to present homosexuality in a progressive fashion in Gothic TV. So this is the background to the first chapter of my PhD thesis, but um, in the interest of time, I'm just going to be focusing on one element of bisexual representation in Buffy today, and that's of the coded bisexuality in Buffy's vampire doubles and the moral judgments on bisexuality that these representations imply. So to do this, I will be focusing specifically on the character of Vampire Willow from season three's The Wish and Doppelgangland, uh, with reference to Xander's vampire double. Um, and if I had time, um, I would also talk about the bisexual coding of Angelus, but um, that is in my thesis, but I don't have time to do that today. So while I'd love to provide like an extensive framework of bisexuality studies to situate my argument in, I just won't have time to do so today. So instead, I just want to give a brief outline of the taxonomy of bisexuality that I'm working with, which is adapted from Kenji Yoshino's The Epistemic Contract of Bisexual Erasure. Here he argues that there are three axes through which bisexuality can be identified and one need only adhere to one axis to be read as bisexual. These include self-identification or labelling oneself as bisexual, conduct, meaning engaging in sexual acts with more than one gender, and finally, desire. 
it's the final axis that I use for my research, as this allows for bisexual readings that may be based in metaphor or subtext, or instances where bisexual self-identification or conduct may not be present due to myriad factors, including censorship. So I'm certain that many of you here today will be familiar with Buffy the Vampire Slayer, but in brief, uh, the series follows teenage heroine Buffy Summers, a blonde, beautiful and charismatic young woman who also happens to be the one girl in all the world chosen to fight the forces of darkness. Across seven seasons, Buffy, a rotating cast of friends known as the Scooby Gang, um, combat vampires, demons, hell gods and the perils of growing up. Most notable among the depictions of sexuality in Buffy and in the spin-off Angel is the character of Willow Rosenberg, Buffy's timid, bookish best friend turned powerful Wiccan goddess, whose power evolves concurrently with her sexuality. Having been depicted as heterosexual in seasons one to three, Willow embarks upon a same-sex relationship in season four and henceforth identifies as a gay woman. Uh, the term lesbian is only used once throughout the entire series. In claiming Willow's sexuality as lesbian, her loving relationship with previous male partners could be viewed to be delegitimised and her bisexual potential is erased. But on the other hand, reclaiming Willow as bisexual carries with it the similarly problematic connotations of her erasing her self-identification as lesbian. So it's not my intention, therefore, to claim that Willow's past relationships with men preclude her from identifying as a gay woman. Instead, I use Willow as a comparison to her vampiric counterpart from another dimension, alongside the villainous double of the heterosexual Xander and the character of Angelus, to reframe the concept of the monstrous gay to instead illustrate a representation of the monstrous polysexual. Willow is first established as a shy, nerdy outcast, desperately in love with her best friend Xander. Upon the advent of season two, Willow enters her first relationship with the werewolf Oz, a relationship which survives throughout the next two seasons until the Scooby Gang arrive at college, despite Willow's secret affair with Xander in season three. Throughout these three seasons, Willow is presented as heterosexual and identifies as gay from season four onwards, although both M. McAvern and Alex Liddell argue that there are a number of ways in which Willow's sexual identity can be read. McAvan argues that Willow can be read as bisexual as she exhibits sexual and romantic desire for both men and women, adhering to Yoshino's desire axis in defining bisexuality. However, as McAvan notes, Willow self-identifies as gay now. This carries a negative connotation of bisexuality existing as a temporary transitional state to either a heterosexual or a homosexual uh, monosexuality. If Willow adheres to both the desire and conduct axes of bisexuality, McAvan argues that this is an example of the text committing by erasure, perhaps to avoid, as uh, Joss Whedon implied in a 2020 interview, a biphobic response from viewers. Little presents a potential counter-argument, stating it can be argued that Willow's character arc is a representation of the lesbian experience of compulsory heterosexuality, as characterised by Adrian Rich, in her article, Compulsory Heterosexuality and Lesbian Experience. Although Liddell's wider examination of female bisexuality in Whedon's work points to this not being the case. While I acknowledge that Willow's relationships with Xander and Oz may be examples of compulsory heterosexuality, Willow's latent bisexual potential is realised in her double. In The Wish, Xander's girlfriend Cordelia, having discovered Willow and Xander's affair, places all the blame on Buffy's entrance into their lives. As a result, Cordelia unknowingly makes a wish to the vengeance demon Anya that Buffy Summers never came to Sunnydale. What follows is an alternate universe narrative. We soon discover that Sunnydale without Buffy has transformed into a terrifying hellscape and a vampire paradise. Without Buffy there to stop the various apocalypses, the master has risen and taken over the town. The students of Sunnydale High dress conservatively and stay indoors after sundown, while the bronze has become a vampire lair and feeding ground filled with stereotypical black leather, bondage gear and blood on tap. Other key figures from the narrative appear in new guises. Most crucially of all, Xander and Willow are subservient to the mas as the master's vampire underlings. Vampire Willow is portrayed as a polymorphously kinky bisexual vampire who presages real Willows coming out in the following season. The heterosexual love story that the show has been building between Xander and Willow in season three remains. 
but the capacity exists to read both characters as bisexual. One of the most potent ways of doing this is through bi-coding via visual presentation. As Liddell notes, and the quote is up on the screen here, in the same way that characters can have their queerness implied by um, representing them as gender non-conforming or camp, the more specific term bi-coding relies on viewers inferring a character's sexuality through appearance, relationship histories and stereotypical behaviour, with the focus on signalling bisexuality above other orientations. In establishing Vampire Willow's villainy, she is cast as Willow's visual opposite, favouring tight leather cat suits and BDSM stylings over Willow's fuzzy sweaters and mom chosen clothes. While I don't have the time today to discuss the nuances of BDSM fashion in the 90s, it suffice to say that this style and its gothic influences was linked to deviancy, particularly due to its resemblance to the styling of the Columbine Massacre offenders. It's very important to note here that it's only when both Willow and Xander are villainised that their bisexual potential becomes explicit. In this way, they mirror season two antagonist Spike and Drusilla. Although these characters are also presented in a heterosexual relationship, one thing that others them sexually is their potential for polyamory with Angelus. In this case, Drusilla receives sexual advances from both her sire, Angelus, and her progeny and lover, Spike. Um, later on in Angel, there's some implications between Angel and Spike as well, but we won't get into that today. Um, in The Wish, our Spike and Drusilla stand-ins, Willow and Xander, also involve Angel in their polyamory, but use them to signify at least a vampire Xander's potential bisexuality. Without, Willow, uh, without Buffy's love and influence, Angel remains a weak, tortured and sold vampire surviving on sewer rats, who, following the Master's ascension, has been taken captive by his grandsire. Willow chooses to keep Angel as a pet, caged and bound both as an animal and a BDSM fantasy, where she tortures him for sexual pleasure. While more subtle, Xander encourages and participates in these sexual games with both his female lover and her male plaything, staring lasciviously at Angel's partially naked form. In another instance of so-called depraved bisexual polyamory, the two characters capture Cordelia in the school library. Cordelia incredulously responds to their undead selves with, are you kidding me? I wish us into Bizarro Land and you guys are still together. This may reinforce their heterosexual relationship, but both desire to feed on and kill Cordelia. This desire to penetrate Cordelia represents Vampire Willow's potential for bisexuality, and Cordelia's death is presented as a sexual act. Xander allows his lady to taste Cordelia first, who comes at Cordelia from the front and bites into her neck. Xander comes up behind Cordelia, seductively brushes the hair away from her neck and bites the other side. Both have their bodies pressed up against Cordelia while also maintaining physical contact with each other. Through the well-established sexual connotations of vampire feeding, we are to read Cordelia's death as a polyamorous sexual act. This particular example may seem like it reinforces Xander's heterosexuality as he's the only male actor in this scene, but his previous interactions with Angel in the Wish universe mark him with the negative stereotype of going after anything that moves. Equally, both the torture of Angel and the death of Cordelia are monstrous, horrific acts that excite Willow and Xander erotically, once again, re once again reinforcing the idea of the depraved bisexual by contrasting the good monosexual Willow and Xander with their evil polyamorous bisexual counterparts. In Buy America, William E. Burston examines the negative assumptions of both bisexuality and polyamory. He states, few good generalizations can be made about bisexuals, and that goes double for the issue of monogamy. As with all other groups, the community includes people who are monogamous, people who are not, people who have sex with more than one partner openly, and those who do so secretly. Going on to comment that the high value placed on monogamy in American society. In this case, non-monogamy is as culturally transgressive in nature as bisexuality, despite Burlston's assertion that humankind is not as monogamous as some would like us to believe. Researchers such as Caleb uh, Vernalis believe that uh, polygamy is an intrinsic part of bisexual identity, commenting that monogamy requires bisexuals to sacrifice full sexual flourishing. Writing in 1999, the year in which the wish first aired, the analysis view that the only way to be authentically bisexual is to be polyamorous is reflected in Vampire uh, Willow and Xander's inclusion of Angel and Cordelia in their erotic torture and feedings. Christian Klesek 
examines this pervasive view of bisexuals as inherently polyamorous in the spectre of promiscuity, commenting that non-monogamy is a troubling issue for many bisexuals because dominant discourse constructs bisexuals as non-monogamous by necessity. The assumption that bisexuals have to be non-monogamous or promiscuous flows from the traditional Western construction of sexuality in a dualistic scheme. If homosexuality and heterosexuality, thought as opposites, are perceived as the only real and valid forms of sexual orientation, then bisexuality can only be thought of as a mixed form of sexuality, consisting in parts of homosexuality and heterosexuality. Consequently, authentic bisexuality is only possible in the context of a non-monogamous life practice. It's also important to note that Burleson and Klesse are discussing consensual polyamory. One element that makes Vampire Willow and Xander's bisexual polyamory monstrous is that both Angel and Cordelia are unwilling participants. In the climax of The Wish, we see the status quo re-established, but not before Willow and Xander are punished for their bisexual monstrosity. In the climactic battle in the bronze, Xander kills Angel, both removing his sexual rival for Willow and his own temptation for him, and is killed by Buffy in response. This also reinforces the one-sided triangle that exists between Xander, Buffy and Angel in the primary timeline. In Between Men, Eve Kosofsky Sedgwick introduces the erotic triangle, in which power relations between men are played out through the conduit of the woman. In this, we are meant to read intense relationships between men as being dependent on a balance of power rather than desire, erasing the potential for the romantic or the sexual. However, Cedric's title emphasises the word desire, reinforcing the erotic potential of this struggle for power. Her theory is that to draw the homosocial back into the orbit of desire, of the potentially erotic then, mm -hmm. is to hypothesise the potential unbrokenness of a continuum between homosocial and homosexual. In Buffy, Xander views, views Angel as a rival for Buffy's affections, although Buffy herself has no interest in Xander beyond friendship. Numerous times, Xander tries to establish his power over Angel through Buffy, such as in Prophecy Girl, when Xander is the one to bring Buffy back to light, uh, back from the dead um, as Angel can't perform CPR, or in Becoming, in which Xander neglects to tell Buffy that a Willow plans to restore Angel's soul, leading to Angel's death and thus the temporary removal of him as rival. However, by introducing the word desire into her theory, Cedric hints at another power dynamic at play. In her theory, desire must be coded so that the desire two men have for each other is channeled through their mutual desire for the female. The two men fighting each other are therefore more invested in each other than the woman in question. This is a dynamic that is repeated throughout both Buffy and Angel. First between Xander and Angel, then Angelus and Spike for Drusilla's affections, Xander and Spike for Buffy's affections, and culminating in Angel between Angel and Spike again for Buffy. In The Wish, the implicit desire of this rivalry is made explicit through the relative safety of the alternate universe, casting Angel as Xander's unwilling rival and lover. According to the bisexual coding of Vampire Willow and Xander and the soulless version of Angelus, Spike and Drusilla, um, the cons a consequence of vampirism in Buffy is the capacity and desire for polysexuality. In the climax of The Wish, Willow is pressed into a phallic stake by Oz, both as a punishment for her monstrous bisexuality and her infidelity, before Giles destroys Anya's amula and re-establishes the primary timeline. Having experimented with a monstrous bisexual potential in the relative safety of an alternate dimension, it's in Doppelgangland, an episode in which vampire Willow is pulled into the primary timeline, that Willow is forced to confront her repressed self in the form of a monstrous, uncanny and bisexual double. This episode is the first to truly establish Willow's growing Wiccan identity and skills in using magic, having previously reinstalled Angelus as a novice witch in season two. Witchcraft is frequently associated with a queer identity in Buffy, and rumours of Willow's growing magical ability, much like rumours of a person, person's sexuality, have spread throughout the student body until they reach the now human Anya. Anya enlists Willow's help to retrieve her amulet from the Wish universe to restore her powers. And Willow, knowing nothing about Anya's true identity and keen to expand her magical knowledge, gladly agrees. Unfortunately, instead of pulling the amulet out of the Wish universe, Willow accidentally drags her vampire doppelganger into the primary timeline, moments before being staked by Oz. 
In this episode, Angel, in a throwaway comment, clearly implies that aspects of the vampire's personality carry over from their human side. In this episode, the reverse is true. Aspects of vampire Willow's sexuality do carry over into Willow's eventual lesbian self-identification and bisexual conduct, even if its natural fruition is not realised on screen until she meets Tara in season four. Willow foreshadows her own sexual awakening by commenting about her double that, I think I'm kinda gay. The word bisexual may not be used, but the use of the word kinda hints at a potential polysexuality. Willow also says I rather than she, acknowledging that vampire Willow is a part of herself. And I believe I have now run out of time. So thank you very much for listening and I will stop sharing my screen. Thanks, Hayley. That was an amazing presentation and has opened up a whole different world for me to have how to, to read these identities. Um, and I'll never re-watch re Buffy in the same way again. <laughs> if you have any questions for Hayley, please put them in the chat or at least indicate in the chat that you want to come and ask her a question later on in our question and answer session. And you already people are saying how wonderful they are. So. So yes, if you have any questions for either of our speakers, please either come on screen or uh, indeed put them in the chat. Let us know that you want to ask a question. And David Norris, do you want to ask? You want to ask a question? So if you'd like to come on and uh, unmute yourself and ask away. You need to unmute yourself though. I do, and I'm trying to, and my hair is a mess. I apologise. Can you hear me? Myself, yes. <laughs> That's great. Thank you so much for, for the discussions. I really appreciate it. Uh, it's the first time that I've come to these sessions today. Uh, so really, really exciting to, to see the kind of work. Um, I, uh, my question is for Heather, I apologise. Um, I, I can't help it because my thesis also pertains to um, spectatorship of horror, in my case, live horror. And uh, I can't come away from that the, the phrase to the to the queer spectator yeah. horror is queer. So the question would be, would you say this is emblematic as perhaps we've touched on at times of something about queerness or queer spectatorship? Or is this emblematic of the self reflexiveness of the horror genre and perhaps affective genres? So maybe comedy and erotica as well in in general. Thus is, is horror a kind of queer genre in some inherent way? Or is horror a mirror to anyone and aspects of their identity? Well, I, I argued on uh, ontologically, I made a try to make an argument that it is a queer genre in its transgressiveness, it, but that transgressiveness is also a reflection of society. So what you're saying, it's kind of melded together in the sense that there is something that queer spectators are seeing that I, I think um, for example, like the next thing I want to study is I now have this new theory that queer people have a more ardent cinephilia than the general population. And I think it's because there's something actually filmically as a medium that has a resonance with queer uh, I guess subjectivity. And horror is the queerest of the genres of this medium that I already think has queer resonance. And I think it has to do with actually more foundational ontological reasons. I think it has to do with political reasons. I have to think, I think it has to do generationally in the sense that what I experience from film and what I experience from horror won't be the same as what a 24 year old has. But I bet you if I'm talking to a 24 year old, there would be more overlap than there wouldn't be. So I don't know if I'm actually answering your question, but I think it's all of the things, but I try to be really careful. Horror is so transgressive and horror does reflect kind of the trauma that societies are trying to get over. So, you know, back to like Linney's books, um, I do think that all other kinds of marginalized populations can reach into horror and find what they need for their, for their community. I am just speaking for what I learned from a bunch of, you know, horror loving queers, including myself. So does that answer? I, I think to some some degree, yeah. I think it's certainly, for, it's it's your answer to it, which is nice. <laughs> that's what I wanted. So that's, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Linny. 
saw your hand up a while ago. Did you have a question as well? I did, but then I kind of got over myself and thought <laughs> this is a postgraduate event and uh, I'll lurk in the background if there's a gap and, uh, you know, if, if a question needs asked, I'll ask one, but it's not really my gig. That's very we'll come back to you then, Lillian, <laughs> in, in a moment. Um, Kate, have you got any other questions in the chat? Yeah, we've got a question from Dennis. Uh, I'll read it out as is, so um, because he has put his question into better words. Um, so his question's also for Heather. He says, have you found in your research a particular queer affection for not just with the sexualized or sexualizable horror characters like vampires, but also with undead characters that are somewhat removed from uh, a sexuality like ghosts or zombies. And then Dennis goes on to say, I would wonder whether these might resonate with the discomfort or uneasiness in one's own skin relating to intimacy and sexuality that's probably more widespread among queers. Just wondering what you'd say to that question. I'd say that I feel like Dennis maybe took that survey and wrote things in because it was like, what was just said? Yes, I found over and over again, not it's not just about a corpus of queer horror films it's about the genre and it's not about particular subgenres within horror it's like almost all of the shops like the subgenres were loved um in consensus like the only one that i think was below consensus but it was kind of consensus in being hated was rape revenge um but number one, I think was, I, I, should have, I should have reviewed all of these, but I'm gonna go from like years of being with this data. Number one was Supernatural Films, the most loved of it at 90 something percent. Uh, vampires, I think came in being loved, like liked or loved at the, in the high seventies, which is still a really incredible consensus. But I do think that uh, queer spectators over and over again in their written responses, in the um, oral histories, they love zombies, they love ghosts, they love witches, they love werewolves, they love vampires, they love them all. <laughs> so it made it really easy to constantly argue that it was about the genre and all of these kind of uh, the abject, the affect, the disembodiment, the all, the all the different things that come with each kind of monster, um, how there is a queer connection to it. And, lot of it because a lot of it because of the societal liminality that we still exist in so yeah thank you um kate you had a question yourself for Haley. i did i wanted to sneak in there before it got too busy in the chat um i was wondering re relating to your thesis Haley. i just wanted to hear a bit more about why actually you chose buffy to focus on um, in regards to its um, relationship with um, sort of bisexual representation. And if you think it has a different way of articulating bisexuality than perhaps other shows, either of the same era of or of the same type. Uh, yeah, sure. So, um, well, first of all, Buffy and Angel are just the focus of my first chapter. So that is kind of like where the journey of the thesis begins. And then I'm going right through to like the end of 2020. That's my thinking at the moment. Anyway, it may change as the project develops. Um, and in terms of why I chose Buffy in particular, um, not only to include, but also to start with, it's, it's more of a personal one than anything in that, you know, I grew up through the 90s and, um, you know, in terms of getting to know my own identity and coming to terms with it, um, the things that helped me with that were um, basically being raised listening to David Bowie and even though Willow doesn't identify as bisexual, it was watching Willow. Um, like Buffy was basically the first kind of TV show I ever loved and that was the thing that got me into gothic and horror um, all through my life. Um, but you know that is kind of like my starting point and I think one of the interesting things about um, looking at Buffy in particular is, as I said at the start, it was very innovative in many ways, um, especially when it came to things like Willow and Tara. Um, but there were limitations and that's partly based on the period, you know, what would coming out of the worst part of the AIDS crisis. Obviously, it's not over in the 90s. Um, 
and we're coming out of a um, a long period of Republican um, you know rule in the US into the Clinton administration um, we're coming up to the new millennium um, lots of change lots of anxiety and then after that um, kind of, while Buffy is still airing we then have things like 9-11 where um, there was this kind of shift afterwards towards more um, conservative views for a while kind of a harkening back to um, to the period of, of family first and kind of shun the others, whether that's a racial other or a sexual other. Um, so it's this it's this interesting period to start with because it's it's trying to do things, but it can't really do perhaps maybe what it wanted to. The, uh, there's an interview with Joss Whedon in 2020 where he said, had Buffy been made today, um, Willow would have been bisexual, but he said that um, audiences weren't ready for that at that time. That was his words. I don't quite agree with that. I I think that um, Willow was such a um, a positive um, role model for lesbian viewers, for gay male viewers, for bisexual viewers, for this whole kind of spectrum. Um, but um, what the consequence is is that these kind of um more sexualized stereotypes falls on the villains and what what heather was saying i agreed with like i don't think that good representation of bisexuality has to be the heroes all the time like that so my favorites to talk about are <laughs> hannibal and will <laughs> and no one would argue that hannibal Lecter is a good person um but it's it sets up this kind of dichotomy where it's it's kind of like it's only the the villains who can kind of at least subtextually realize their bisexual potential and uh, the heroes can't um that kind of changes throughout the period i'm looking at but it's also kind of reinforced so there is some um excellent kind of very positive very nuanced depictions of bisexuality but then i think to we, we get to the end of 2020 and we get to the end of supernatural <laughs> and um you know the whole kind of re resolution to 15 years of queer, queer bait in dean and castiel um was kind of it felt like a step back to a pre-buffy time where it it was like the the doors that buffy kind of opened it felt like supernatural was kind of trying to to slam those closed in a way um so it's it's a complex question to answer and that's why i wanted to do my thesis you know what constitutes um good representation what constitutes bad representation it's it's something that people are going to disagree on so i know some of my friends when i've talked to them about buffy for example they've said that um they think that Willow was bad representation because they erased her loving relationship with us. Whereas other people have said it is good representation because it's shown how sexuality can evolve over time as we we discover our own identities. Um, and you know you don't have to be certain of your identity like right from birth or even into your adulthood. Um, and I think that's where I mean I'm still. I've still got a lot of way to go in the project, but they're the kind of questions I want to answer. It's not a it's not a very um, easy one to to kind of get your head around what what constitutes good representation, what uh, representation, what constitutes biphobia, what constitutes bi erasure. Um, so I don't have the answer to that yet. That is the whole point of me doing this research, but that is what motivates me to to continue with it. And I specifically chose television in particular because of um unlike film um there is not apart from maybe franchise films there's not really the opportunity to to see that kind of development and progress uh, particularly with bisexuality so you know unless we're seeing a polyamorous relationship um we don't often get the time to see like a character in multiple relationships in film whereas we get that opportunity in television so yeah that's why I selected that in particular hope that answered your question that absolutely did that was a great answer thank you so much I'll be mulling over it a bit later uh, I think you actually I think you actually even started to answer Xavier's question as well which was <laughs> are there any developments that you could 
could you, you could signify post Buffy and I think you've actually already sort of um, answered that but is there anything you I, I could add? answer a couple more yeah so um just it kind of ties back to what Heather was answering earlier about kind of the vampire is a very easy one to kind of sexualize um so you know I, I look at things like true blood and uh, stuff as well but um I think there's this shift also in kind of seeing this representation in other um maybe monsters uh, i use monsters very loosely because that could include human monsters or supernatural monsters so there's there's a growing trend of this representation in the zombie for example so i look at um in the flesh if you were looking at film there's things like um otto or up with dead people um so um, and this, the werewolf, um, like Team Wolf is involved in my research as well. Um, so I feel like one of the biggest developments post Buffy is kind of seeing, OK, so this is something that we can explore with vampires. What else can we do? So as well as those, there's also, um, you know, Chilling Adventures of Sabrina, looking at those um, developments within witchcraft and also within um, Satanism. There's satan himself as a bisexual figure in things like lucifer and also in sabrina so it's it's opening up the the scope for study since buffy and that's kind of like opened the doorway to examine uh, these different monsters that we we can bring into this research awesome uh, i think we have a couple of other questions as well in the chat um kate yeah we've got one from emily and this is for both panelists um so reading it as is uh, do we think most villains are coded as bi due to horror's love to threaten the nuclear family and the status quo of straight society um relating to the bisexual as coded for a long time as being loose of morals or Im immoral in some way um emily asked is that what the writers are attempting when villains are coded as bi? I think that depends on who the writer is. Um, so looking at my text specifically, um, the, um, the texts that seem to reinforce um, those messages more are the ones that are written by straight white men or in some cases uh, gay white men. Um, the the texts that kind of explore it with more nuance are those that come from women come from bisexually identified people themselves um i'm sure that's also the case when it comes to things like trans representation and that's not to say that um a person who doesn't belong to a particular label can't write those characters well that's just kind of something that i have noticed um and often I think it's it's intentional, uh, unintentional as well, like that they're, they're trying to, um, you know, to present um, something positive. But in doing that, they're viewing maybe their own um, background as this is the positive thing. So if they come from maybe a nuclear family, they want to show, oh, look, trans people or bisexual people can have this perfect family too we're all the same they're just like us um and maybe it's more kind of the alternate lifestyles that are um questioned or maybe um put down a bit more than the specifics of what gender is the person you're having sex with i have that yeah, I mean, I think that I would agree with a lot of what Haley said. I think that what's more interesting to me is looking at would these characters for, I, I don't know who the person who asked the question is, but like if they had particular portrayals in mind, but I also think we're moving into a time where um, the way we talk about and understand gender is totally going through a very, like to me, it's a revolutionary moment. And I think that what we're going to see is um, an increase in pansexual representation, because that's what I feel like is the thing. And I think when you have a pansexual representation, it becomes a lot more insidious to be able to get into any of the cracks. But back to Haley's point, it depends on who's writing it and what the actual ultimate 
um, goal is. And I am not up to date on enough new horror television to like say that I see a trend or anything like that right now. Cause I was just so mired in my research. I haven't been watching horror television to know, but I think that keep up, keep an eye on the uh, pansexual villain. Indeed, we will. I think we have time for one more question and potentially even coming back to Linny at the end. Um, okay. We've got a question from Finn. Uh, so it's a question for Heather, but feel free to jump in, Haley, if you have anything to uh, say as well. Um, Finn says, you mentioned some films with homophobia and transphobia being popular in your research, as in Silence of the Lambs was the one you talked about. Um, did any speak to any of the participants speak to loving those films because they provided some level of cathartic experience in processing trauma um or is it more of a i will take any representation regardless of how good or bad it ends up being mixed mixed it's uh like you know we have all these different individuals who come with all the different experiences there's absolutely data that shows that people would take any representation for a while and there's data of people who spoke very deeply not buffalo bill as much as a deep love for buffalo bill but absolutely a deep love for angela in sleepaway camp who is often writ written about as being like it's that the film should be canceled we shouldn't be showing it as transphobic and um, one of the oral histories was with a trans woman who at the time was actually wearing like a Angela like jacket like you know she's a deep love for Angela so I think it is um, that's the beauty of oral history work humans are complex we're complex beyond our actual understanding of our own complexity and it is a mixed bag of you'll you want to see anything and it also has like a trauma healing component to it, but it doesn't mean that you don't love it. You're not like hate loving it, you're loving loving it. If that, yeah, makes sense. Yeah, um, I did just, I wanted to say that pretty much, I agree. So if I'd been filling out the, the survey, um, I think I would feel that there's a mix of both as well, you know. Um, I mean, even thinking about my own research, I said about how terrible the, the end of Supernatural was. I still had a great time watching it. Um, and I think part of that was just kind of there's there's a community aspect to it, especially things like TV show and contemporary where, you know, you have people live tweeting things and, um, you know, it's seeing something that isn't done well sparks as much community and discussion and um, development of um, you know queer community as seeing things that are done well so I think I've had these same conversations about Silence of the Lambs because I love Hannibal the TV series I love Silence of the Lambs but I recognize how problematic it is um, and discussing with my trans friends their feelings about Buffalo Bill sparks further conversation so I think if you just limit yourself to these are the good ones, then you're missing out on a whole kind of uh, discussion point and also maybe considering ways that things can be improved for the future. Awesome, thank you. Um, I'm going to squeeze in one quick, one quick question um, and then I'm also going to ask Kate if you can uh, put those um, Instagram accounts for both panellists back into the chat for us. I think they were there earlier. Um, so the last question then for Heather, how has your practice changed since the horror questionnaire? Was the one you did on the portrait of the lady significantly different? No, uh, wasn't significantly different, but what was different was uh, I tried to ask the questions to collect quantitative data to answer the things that I didn't get for the first one. So what I really regretted, um, well, regrets maybe the wrong word, but I really wanted to know more about people's understanding of their own queerness and how they experience queerness and how much um, discrimination or microaggressions or outright hostility they face in their day-to-day -day life now as an out queer person or when they were trying to come out or if they are out. And that's the thing that I did not capture for the horror living queers, but I did capture for the um, lesbian and non-binary portrait survey. So 
I think that what the easiest way of saying that is when I created the horror loving queer survey, I was going after horror loving queers, not thinking about the fact that I needed to capture way more. I, I captured so much about their love of horror, but I didn't capture enough about their um, how they understand their queerness. Even though I asked, I did ask numbers of questions about their queerness, but I wish I had asked three times as many. Um, so that's that's the thing. And the answers I got from the a uh, portrait survey just reinforce how much I wish I had, a, I could have that data for that, you know, that subset and how many people still feel very unsafe in this world being queer. Thank you. Um, I think we're coming up to our time now. So thank you both very much for some excellent um, insights into so to our lgbtq history month and your research the talks that we've had today it's been amazing and particularly as well your approaches to your research thank you to my team for helping me out in the background and answering questions etc etc and thank you to the audience for all your questions and interacting with our speakers as well i'm going to hand you to ali who's just going to wrap up a few things for us um, but if you can all join us with virtual thank you very much for Haley and heather um, so yeah, I would like to extend my um, thanks to Haley and Heather for both wonderful contributions to our seminar series. And I also like to thank the audience because obviously you're just as equally as important in all of this. Um, a couple of reminders. Uh, one is that uh, this will be up on the Manchester Centre for Gothic Studies YouTube channel. Um, yeah, soon. Um, uh, the Manchester University Press discount code is in the chat. Um, I think I can get Kate to maybe post it at the bottom again so people can access it access it e easily. Um, oh, there we go. Perfect. The YouTube channel has been put in. Um, our next session is on the 17th of this month and it'll be at our normal time from 5.30 to 7 and that will be on Irish Gothic. So please join us. Um, we would like to see you all there. Uh, we do these things to kind of showcase people in our department and just so the kind of wider audience and audiences can get to know uh, what's going on our, with our postgraduate research. And if you have any questions um, or issues, please email us at mmugothicapproaches at gmail.com. And uh, we hope to see you all in a couple weeks time. Oh, and great. There's an Eventbrite link for the Irish Gothic, so please register and sign up and thank you all for coming. Thank you.